Okay. Hi, my name is Natalie Kozlowski, and this presentation is called How to Interact with Your Front End Developer on Your Ruby Project, or How to Keep Your Front End Developer Happy on Your Ruby Project. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm currently the front end developer and designer for CodeGuard. We're based here in Atlanta. Before that, I did my Bachelor of Arts in Professional Writing at Michigan State University. Um, so, what is front end development? Um, here's a tweet I found that shows how someone else tried to describe it. And for me, really, it means many different things. <laughs> so at CodeGuard, I've been lucky enough to work on a lot of different types of projects, um, including website projects, redesigning our homepage, um, working inside the application on new features. Um, I also do a lot of graphic design work for CodeGuard. And here's a friendly reminder that we do have beer for you guys in the back over there. I'm sure you all know by now. Um, uh, T-shirt designs, infographic designs, so a pretty wide range of things, if this, if this gives you an idea of the kind of work I like to do. So what do we front-end developers do in any given day? Do we write div and p tags all day? Do we write controller methods? Do we debug IE all day? Hopefully not. Um, test pages on mobile devices all day, um, create Photoshop mockups, wireframes. And what does it all mean for your Ruby project? Front-end or client-side development um, may be a relatively obscure internet discipline, but in the end, I think it's this hinge role that requires both aesthetic sensitivity and programming rigor. For me, it's a balance between design and development. Um, so it's my opinion that front-end developers are kind of that bridge between designers and back-end developers, and it's of course important that communication between these different roles is strong on a project. So whether you write Ruby or Python or Perl or Go, um, I think I'll be able to provide helpful tips on how you might um, interact with your front-end developer to keep them happy and keep everyone happy and keep projects moving forward. Because in the end, it's about the work that we do and making sure that our projects and our products are successful. So this talk will be about my experiences of what has worked and what hasn't worked for me when it comes to collaborating with a back-end team. Some of these lessons learned came from working at CodeGuard and some from other projects that I've worked on. Um, and for reference, throughout the presentation, when I say we, I, or us, I mean um, front-end developers. When I say you, you guys, I mean back-end developers. And just uh, real quick, how many people would call themselves a front-end developer? Oh, we got, <laughs> we got a few. Okay, well, you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about then throughout this presentation. And who here might call themselves a back-end developer? A lot more of you? Okay, so I'm guessing you guys aren't making things look good all by yourself. So <laughs> hopefully you're working with a front end developer, you're working with a designer. These tips will be able to help you interact with them better and keep everyone happy. So let's get started. The first tip is to get involved with the design process. At least don't be afraid to get involved with the design process. The best backend developers that I've worked with all cared as much about usability and the end user as I did on a project. And when I say get involved with the design process, I don't mean open up my mockups in Photoshop and start adding gradients to things and rounding corners. It's definitely not what I mean. What I do mean is to care about design and care about usability. So how do you do that? Um, ask to see your designer or your developer's wireframes or sketches. For example, if a project is given a week for the design phase and it's Monday, Wednesday at lunch, say something like, you know, how are those wireframes coming along? Can I see them? Um, or if your front-end developer or designer approaches you seeking some feedback, you know, quick feedback about something that we're designing, you know, don't be afraid to say no. Um, it could be, or don't be afraid to say yes, I mean, it could take, you know, just two minutes of your time. If you have two minutes to spare, and sometimes that really is all it takes to give us your quick input, um, that is honestly very helpful for us, because you guys have a very different approach to design than we have, obviously, so we like getting your opinion. Um, so I'll give an example now of when asking for feedback from the backend guys really helped me out. Um, this feature here is called our Website Backup Success Graphs, or Database Backup Success Graphs. Um, so this is a, here a screenshot of the final product in the dashboard. Oh, let me get rid of this. I need to do that. 
Um, so here's a screenshot of what the final, pro the final product was. Um, and so is this one. The goal behind this feature was to find a way to display success, in back success information to the customer about their backups in the dashboard um, very quickly, you know, at the top of the page. We wanted to provide a greater level of transparency um, to them about when things go wrong with their account so they can take quicker, uh, more quick action to, you know, to resolve it so the issues go away. Um, but I went through a lot of different design ideas before I settled on that final one. So here's a screenshot of one of those variations. We wanted something um, on the main dashboard page that quickly drew users' eyes in to where the problems were. So in this example, I have a big red stripe going across the whole page. Um, I thought this was a good idea because the bar is close to the graph information. So you can clearly see 83% success for websites that week. It's not that good. And then right there, you have the red bar. So the, in prox because of the proximity of the two pieces, you know, they're related. Hopefully, people, the user would draw that conclusion. Um, so this is one of the things you know, I was thinking about when I was going through. I didn't want to overload the page too much with detailed information about errors right then and there. So you know, click the link to go view more detailed information. With this variation, uh, we played with the idea of having separate tables that appear um, in the dashboard above where we list all of your websites and databases in your account. Um, this was a, a really challenging concept to make look right um, because, you know, what if the, a website has an error but the database that's associated with it doesn't? You know, do we gray it out in the table that looks, you know, is, are people going to be confused when they see this? Um, you know, and what if, and so, you know, this is another variation. I just put the bar at the top, you know, just playing with layouts. This example is similar to the other one again. Um, I have the website errors and database errors in two different tables. But again, like what if the database is down here? How will the user know which website that database belongs to? Um, so that's a challenge, you know. So you hit this page, you can clearly see what, what websites, what databases are experiencing errors, but the relation is kind of lost. Um, so back to the winning design. Um, I sat down with Jonathan and Randall, who are two of our backend developers, and I wanted to talk up to them about these different variations I had and get their feedback. Um, and they really helped me pick this winning design in the end, because I knew there were good components and bad components to each approach I had. But you know, sometimes when you stare at something for so long, you you know you can't see straight anymore, and that goes for code as well. You you stare at something for so long that you can't really see the difference anymore between what you have. So getting a fresh pair of eyes is very helpful here. Um, showing these designs to another designer probably would have been helpful, but again, showing them to a backend developer helped me see a whole new perspective. They were able to tell me what made sense to them with the variation, uh, what was confusing, where they thought I could make small improvements to make a section better. For example, they liked the colors of the first design with the red popping that drew the user's eye in. Um, but then we decided, you know, what if we move that idea, that red that draws your eye in, into the table itself? So we have, I don't know if you can see on the, the monitor, we have striping in the tables in the end that have um, red colors if your backup just failed yesterday, yellow colors if it failed within that week. Um, so, you know, a combination that they helped me get to that point. So how else can you start to show that you care about usability? Um, voice your opinions about the designs and voice them honestly. Don't just accept what I create as the be-all, end-all of how this page should look. Um, if I came to you guys and said, hey guys, this is the new button for our homepage, like this is it, um, and you think that's an ugly button, tell me that's an ugly button. Um, if five people in the room all think this is an awesome button and you're the only one that thinks it's ugly, still speak up. I want to hear your opinions. What's its conversion rate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or if I put a piece of content at the top of the page, you know, another piece of bottom at the another piece of content at the bottom in a mock-up, and you think they should be flipped, you know, let me know that too. Let me know why. Like I think that content Y is much more important than content X. You know, let's move it to the top so it has um, higher importance on the page. Or if you think that I got the order right and you're just curious to know why, you know, ask me. Like that's that's a great design decision. Why did you put the content in that order? Um, it's comforting to know when a back-end developer that I'm working with wants to stay informed about my design decisions. It lets me know that you care about the user's experience, and it makes working with you that much more enjoyable for me. 
I've worked in environments before where front-end devs and back-end devs really clashed over caring about the end user. The back-end developer really wanted the project to move you know, forward more quickly. They wanted me to get the design done, the code done as quickly as I could so they could start their work. And subconsciously, it makes me think that, you know, that my work isn't valued as much. Um, at CodeGuard, the backend guys are not shy at all about jumping in um, to the design process with me. You know, when it's time to start brainstorming a new feature, I don't just go off in a dark corner with my sketchbook and brood until I create something genius. Um, but sometimes, you know, all of us just jump on the whiteboard together and we start sketching out ideas and layout together. And I can't tell you enough how refreshing it is to have backend developers that like jumping in and jumping in on this process and this part of the project. Um, I may not incorporate all of the ideas they come up with, but again, it, hearing that perspective is important because it's different. And when it comes time to start coding, it's nice to know that you guys have a visual in your mind of what the final product will be. <coughs> so to recap, um, get involved with the design process, care about usability, and you can do that by asking to see my wireframes. Um, don't be afraid to voice your own opinions um, about the designs I show you ask me questions about my designs. Um, these all tell me that you care about the design, um, which is great for any project. So the next big step is to walk your front end developer through your code. This is a must when it comes to that integration period when the back end code is done being written and the front end code is done being written and it's time to fit all the pieces together, you know, to, to complete everything. Um, before I begin working on this integration, Randall and Jonathan or Steve, they'll always sit down with me first, face to face, and walk me through the code, um, what they did, where they wrote um, changes, what files were edited, things like that. And these can be very short meetings, three to five in-person meetings in front of the same computer monitor that we're looking at together. You know, just explain out loud to me what the code does. And yes, I could, in theory, gather this information from your, you know, the commit history, your commit messages. I could dig around in GitHub to find out what's going on. But these small in-person meetings are incredibly helpful, and they give me a much deeper level of understanding of what the code is doing. Um, because just like I want you to understand my design decisions, I'm sure you want me to understand your coding decisions. And again, it's about you know, everyone getting on the same page so that the end product can be successful. And yes, as a front-end developer, it's also our job to interact with the Ruby, Ruby code and make modifications ourselves and create methods. But for the more complicated pieces of a project, um, this, the speed at which I can absorb the code is just faster this way. <clears throat> and this may seem like common sense, but just make it easy for me to look at your code. Um, comment your code thoroughly so that I have a reference point for what a method does. Also, make a list of what I may need to do in order to run your code. Like, do I need to run a database migration? Do I need to run this script in the console before I can run your code? Um, if you're used to working solely with backend developers on a project, adding a comment at the top of your methods to explain what it does may seem like an unnecessary step to you. But because, um, because the functionality is so obvious, but a front-end developer going through that code at a later point in time may be reading through it at a slower pace, and we really do appreciate these comments. Um, so the top example, yeah, that, that doesn't really help me out. Um, the second one's better. At least I get an idea of the actions that are starting to happen. And the, the third one is, is great. I know exactly what is happening in this code at this point. Um, so this is the third example would be a great example of what to do. And they can be, you know, just 10 words or less, but descriptive. The most interesting thing to me about that slide is that you look at code at all. Is that yeah. typical front-end developers? I have no idea what language you use to deal with the front-end developer. Do, they, do people, your peers, typically work entirely in uh, wireframes in Photoshop? Do you do HTML? Do you do HTML? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I don't have any idea at all how I would even what common ground there is to talk about this stuff? So at CodeGuard, that is a great question. At I mean, CodeGuard, code guard, but I mean, you have probably a lot more experience than I in what the founders do. Right. And what their skill level is or their orientation is, I guess. In my experience, it really is a mix between designing and then writing front-end code. So the front-end code meaning like HTML, um, CSS, Haml or SAS, uh, JavaScript, um, in designing in Photoshop, you know, creating the layout and design of a page, how it will look, you know, we're thinking through the experience the user will have when they're on that page, and then writing the code to build that view. 
Um, but oftentimes, especially in the web app, there are a lot of instances where you know backend code still needs to be written. You know, to, if you're interacting with forms, and um, so Jonathan or Randall, they'll write that part of the code, and then at some point, you know, the, the code has to speak to each other. They need to connect, and so that's when. Um, if I need to go through and make small little modifications in a, in a method to to make the view work, that's where um, going through and having seeing that you guys have comments in your code, that's when that's really helpful for me. It's not often I go um, into methods. You know, like it's not every day I may go into a model or a controller and make changes, but it does happen. Um, so it's helpful when I do that. Um, you know, code is commented, and then you can sit down and walk me through what you did, so I can understand it. Does that kind of help explain? So how, how typical are you? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> how typical? I think it really depends on the shop. Probably it's the, the, the long and short of it. There are some, there are some places where, I think, where I've seen front-end developers like Natalie that can dig into the back-end code, and I've seen other, places, other shops where pretty much they stick in just HTML, right? And they're taking care of all the stylistic pieces, but then when it comes to any back-end modifications, that's in your purview as a backend developer. So and even that surprises me. I kind of thought they worked entirely in, I guess, Photoshop or some equivalent. That's a designer. Yeah, yeah, that's a designer more than anything. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of why this, you know, front end developer term is and is obscure, you know, because we some of us do a lot of design and code, and some of us do more, you know, just coding. Um, so it varies and. You know, having these, having a conversation with your your fear front end developer, your designer that you may work with. You know, what works for you is is a good conversation to have. Um, you can have some really hardcore front end development. I mean, Google, the program she's using now, that would technically be a largely front end application because it runs. I mean, is, would you consider that there? Like uh, the presentation tool you're using. It, is that front end or back end? Is a mix. Like, when, how do you declare you know, the boundary? But there, what I'm just pointing out is, front end programming can be very, very hardcore. It's not. Yeah. There's back end. That's the serious stuff, and the front end is making it pretty. I mean, right. Is, there's a lot of overlap sometimes. Yeah. It depends, I guess, from person to person, like developer to developer. But there can be a lot of overlap or none at all. Yeah. There, um, it's a very interesting. Field. Well, if you take things like like Backbone and stuff like that. That's hardcore development using something like Backbone or something like that. Not a, is that under the purview of what, what's front-end development? Yeah, I, I would consider that under the umbrella of front-end yeah. development. Yeah, okay. Um, so similar to walk your developer through your code, um, also make yourself available for mid-project check-ins. The three to five minute meetings I was talking about are good for the high level understanding of the code um, because I want to you know, be respectful of your time. I don't want to take an hour of your time for you to go through and explain in excruciating detail what every line does. Um, so the three to five minute meetings in the beginning more high level, but after that, you know, make yourself available for questions that might arise from you later at a later point in time because questions about your backend code are bound to happen. And it's important for me to know on any project that I can approach the backend developer I'm working with um, if I think I need to. You know, don't just write your code, hand it off to me, and then you know, cut communication with me for the rest of the project. And I'm sure that's true for any developer, not just front-end developers. Um, Well-written commit messages and thoroughly commented code um, are great to have, but be open to also sitting down with me at some point as well. Um, or available, you know, via HipChat, GChat, Skype, whatever your company uses for chat communication. And most importantly, if I do ask for that one method to be explained to me a second time, please be patient with me. You know, it'd be nice to know if you didn't want to throw a computer across the room at me if I needed to ask, you know, hey, what, what does this do again? Um, I'd really like it if you could explain what this does. <laughs> Um, so to recap, um, again, to you, it, uh, it may seem painfully obvious, some of these things, but I don't ever want to feel hesitant if I need to ask for a second time for some context, if it's what I need for me to complete my work. It's one of those scenarios where five minutes of your time may save me an hour of mine, um, which brings us back to the goal behind our work, you know, which is to successful completion of projects in time-efficient ways. Um, so do walk us through your code and explain what files you edited and why explain why you made the coding decisions that you did. Um, 
And don't forget to provide me instructions I may need to run your code. <clears throat> and then be available in some fashion for mid-project check-ins. Uh, they can be in person, you have your hit chat, hip chat, um, G chat. Um, put time on the calendar for sometime later in the day, like, hey, I'm busy right now, but how about we talk at 2 p.m.? Stuff like that is fine. And most importantly, again, um, be patient if a second explanation is needed, because sometimes a second explanation is just needed. So this final tip, it may be the most important tip um, for keeping your front-end developer happy and for keeping projects on schedule. Provide detailed testing feedback. So front-end developers are usually in charge of browser testing when it comes to new features. And when it comes to browser testing, there are quite literally a million things that could go wrong, maybe a billion or a trillion. So there are a lot of browsers, and you have to test all of those browsers. And sometimes they behave differently in different operating systems. And sometimes they're mobile browsers, and you gotta test all of those. And you know, you throw resolutions and a lot of stuff in there, and it can get overwhelming pretty fast. <coughs> so at CodeGuard, when it comes time to test, uh, after a project is done being developed and we all set a time aside during the day to go through the project and try and break the feature and test it, naturally between the front-end developer and the back-end developer, we're trying to break the feature in different ways. Um, so this piece of advice may come from working on a smaller team, but being the only front-end developer on a project uh, is tough because that's only one pair of eyes trying to catch all of the things that could go wrong in all of these different devices and these browsers and these mobile browsers. Um, and when something slips through the cracks, you know, that's bad for the whole team and our end user. So if you have time to spare, an extra pair of eyes on um, any browser is extremely helpful for me. Um, if you notice something that looks weird in mobile Safari while you're testing, that backend you know, piece of code you wrote, just let me know. Or if you are set out to test a piece of your backend functionality you wrote, you know, and you have some free time on your hands, you know, just pop it open in Firefox just for kicks. You know, if you find something that I need to fix, you know, then that's great. It's better than not finding it and the user finding it instead. And if you do find something weird, um, tell me what browser you're, you were using at the time, what version and what operating system you were using at the time. Better yet, send me screenshots whenever possible. And this dramatically decreases the time I have to go hunting for that thing you saw. Um, if I already know what I'm supposed to be looking for ahead of time. So if you hip chat or gchat or email me something like this screenshot here, I'm gonna think you're awesome. Um, I'm going to get rid of this again. Um, I'll be instantly depressed that I have to go work in Internet Explorer, but I will be very happy that at least I, ha I know exactly what I need to know to go fix this. You know, po error pointing to what's going wrong. Internet Explorer 6 was testing in Windows XP, and the page happened. It happened on our professional page. So doing something like this... Hey, Natalie, I noticed something weird in Firefox earlier on the checkout page. You should take a look at it later. Someone says to me while I'm eating my lunch that day, away from my computer. No. <laughs> so Firefox 26, 25, 13, Mac, Windows, where on the page? Um, if it's Firefox version 26, that's our second most used browser by our users, according to Google Analytics. And if that's the case, I'm going to stop eating lunch right now and go take a look at it. Was it Firefox version 10? Okay, well that's a little more low priority. I'll finish eating my lunch in peace and then I'll go take a look. We use issues in GitHub to, you know, to report bugs that we find. So if you wanna go ahead and open a bug with a screenshot and pre-assign it to me, that's the best case right there. Also write down the steps that you took to reproduce the bug. If you write down a list for me that goes something like this, well, first I clicked the input box, then I clicked this link, then I typed something over here, and after that I tried to submit the form, and then it looked really weird in Safari for a second. Um, the whole page turned into Comic Sans, it was bizarre. Um, <laughs> yeah, the blue screen of death colors showed up, it's, you should look into that. Um, so having a list for me written out so that I can look at um, the steps that it took you to reproduce that bug is incredibly helpful. Um, so to recap this section, provide us with browser testing feedback that is useful to us. Be aware of browser testing when you test your code too. And if it's super high priority, like you just found a bug that's on production and it's impacting 100% of our users on the checkout page, they can't sign up, something like that, just turn your monitor and show me right then and there. Um, but otherwise, having screenshots for me to reference later and a 
list written out for me to check later um, is very important because if it's just said to me out loud, most likely I'll forget and we don't want that to happen. So to conclude, uh, being a front-end developer means that you are many things in one. At least that's what it means for me. In my case, it means being the Swiss army knife of the project that can design, write front-end code, and understand the back-end code so that I can integrate it into my work. Um, we design, we write code, we work in Photoshop, we work in the console and in browsers and desktop, tablet, and mobile devices. So my first tip is to get involved with the design process. Do you care about user, the user experience? Um, do this by questioning the decisions that we make. Um, be open to having conversations with us about our designs. Um, again, the best backend developers that I've worked with, um, the times when projects and collaboration has gone the smoothest, is when I worked with developers that cared as much about the design and usability as I did. Next, walk us through your code when the integration period starts. Um, hold three to five minute in-person meetings to give me a high level understanding and then make your code easier for me to understand, um, like the common example. Make yourself available for questions later in the project, and please be patient with me if I have to ask for a second time, what does this method do? Uh, provide feedback to us in a format that is useful to us. Um, you found a bug in Chrome, you know, what did you do? Send me a screenshot. You know, I can't stress enough how helpful screenshots are. Some of these things may seem like common sense again, but some of them are so easy to do that they're also perceived as unimportant to a developer sometimes. And I've worked with backend developers in the past who didn't care about some of these things, and it did make my work, hard, my work harder because of it. In my experience, the closer the gap between the designer and the backend developer, the better the project went. Um, and in my case, I do fill that role, like I said, so the closer I work with the backend team at CodeGuard, the better. Um, I want to keep them informed about my design decisions, just like I'm sure you want people to understand the code that you write. And we all have strengths and weaknesses, and so coming together to make the project a success, having this strong communication between the different roles that, we, that are going on in a project, um, you know, it's, it's just important for everyone to make sure that the product is, success, is a success. So I hope you learned something, and thank you for listening. more questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, so how are you, uh, so one of the things like I'm constantly seeming, I'm um, having to learn is, uh, you know, different kind of templating technologies and web framework technologies, Hamel, Slim, Angular, all these different things. How are you kind of impacted by that? And does that impact your relationship with the designers and, and with the back-end developers? And you mean like as a developer, when you learn something like that, how does it impact the designer? Or the yeah, I, I guess. I'm just, you know, it, do you find that it makes your job more difficult? So. I mean, I think, you know, when developers take the time to learn something new, that it can never hurt, you know, the team. You right. another level of expertise to something. Right. Is that? Yeah. Uh, I, I guess, uh, so, so, I mean, like, are the designers that you work with, are they, are they using uh, those, are they commit, writing, like, code in those technologies, or are they, like, writing HTML, and y'all are, as a front-end developer, you're doing translations between those things? Um, well, for where I currently work, I am kind of the only front-end developer and the only designer, so okay. I don't really interact with other designers um, immediately. I mean, I have friends that we call themselves front-end developers, and they also can, you know, jump into back-end code no problem, and they know how to wield Photoshop and Illustrator with ease. Yeah. Um, but it just depends, I think, from designer to designer, from developer to developer, <laughs> what they can do. Okay. How do I deal with a front-end designer or, or a front-end developer that is really, really sensitive? Really, really sensitive, <laughs> like about their designs. Um, I mean, personally, I like it when someone tells me something looks wrong. Yeah, most of them don't. 
goes back to the other question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, because like I said, being the, being the only designer where I am, it's hard because I, I want that harsh criticism. You know, if I if I show something to one of the developers, usually the feedback I get is like, wow, that looks great, you know, but I want that harsh criticism because that's, you know, when you start to get really creative, you know, oh, this didn't look good. Like, okay, back at the drawing board, how can I just reinvent what I just did? And then usually at that point, you come up with something that was better than before. Um, so I would encourage them. I mean, just let them know that you want to get involved with the design process. To me, it's important. And I think if you show that you care about this and they ask them like, oh, you put this here. Like, why did you do that? You know, I see you boxed off this content and you made the background this color. Like, why did you do that? Like, just keep asking them questions about it. I think they like having those conversations no matter what. Um, so you can open it up that way. Yeah, okay, so when you're thinking about design for a project or a page or something like that, I saw you had the infographics and whatnot. Like, are you thinking about um, like what kind of technologies a developer would have in a stack already? Anything about, like a hard the scope of that design is going to be and stuff like that? Like for instance, I can imagine like a, that infographic could have been a PDF or it could have been like a you know, awesome JavaScript library that they're using. Stuff like right. That, right? Yeah. Well, when it comes time to think about a page layout and a feature and what I think the user is going to want to see and what I want to think about their experience, like I try to remove myself completely from thinking about code. You know, like if I think that the best experience for the user is they see, you know, this form look this way and in the back of my mind, I know it's going to be a very difficult challenge, maybe for the back end guys. Like I don't think that the challenges of the code should um should dictate what the design is going to be. I think the design should always dictate, like it should be the other way around, if that makes sense. The design should always come first. Don't think about the code or the technologies behind it yet. Think about what is most important for the information that needs to be displayed. And then later have a discussion with your developers, like, okay, now how do we make this happen? So, so you could have been like, yeah, this is, you have a lot of great plans for the, like some uh, user experience and interaction with something, and then you go and talk to developers, and they're like, you know, we have like 10 hours scoped out for this thing. It's going to take you two weeks to learn how to do this. Right. And so that kind of would go back and feedback the way that you're thinking about the design track, right? Like, oh, I got to go back. And it's true. And, you know, sometimes, you know, projects do have timelines and schedules. And if it takes 10 hours for something to be done, but really you need that thing done, at, you know, in five hours. Um, usually we try and get out what we call an MVP, minimum viable product. We build kind of like a maybe like a skeleton structure of what we want it to be in the end something very basic that kind of resembles the end product and we iterate on it so okay version one comes out this week next, next week we do version two then we roll version three and we work up or work our way up to that final product so at least we can get something out the door so our users can start using it we can start getting feedback we work our way up to that final that final you product you can kind of amend your design to, to, to work with those iterations and stuff. yeah Question about the, the environment you're using. So, are, you, are we having a, a server computer and different browser inside that? First, so I have to think about the environment. And second thing is, uh, since you are developing in parallel with the developer, so that, uh, at the very beginning, are you using some placeholder? And how, how you um, demonstrate or display your concept? So, at the beginning, you might use Photoshop, but later on, you, you might have straightforward HTML, CSS. And then with some placeholder? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Um, we often work in parallel, so we have a feature, and I design it, and then I'll start writing the HTML and the CSS right, like right away before the backend code is even written. Sometimes um, I'll start building out that layout. Uh, we actually use Haml and SAS for like our HTML and CSS. So I'll start building that before the backend code is needed. But you know, if I'm able to share my wireframes and my designs with the backend team, and they know, like I can say, like, okay, well, this form is going to need to be submitted to this you know, this controller, you know, this page is going to have to save some new user information. If I can tell them what the design will be, they can start writing it at a later point. And, you know, so then I can write my code and they can write theirs and eventually it all comes together. That kind of, and then you had a question about my personal environment. Um, what? My, my next question, well, actually, I, I'm okay. But my next question is, so when you code, you are not using any tools. It's a straightforward CSS HTML. And, but if you do HTML, but there are too many browsers and too many devices in the market, what's, um, do you set a common dilemma for your 
HTML standard is a by four. What is the adjustment point? Right. Well, um, we are using HTML5 in, in our website and stuff. Um, when it comes to browser testing, we use a service called Browser Stack. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's really great for, um, you can test, it has a list of a lot of uh, browsers like Safari and Firefox and Internet Explorer and Chrome, and you can switch between viewing it on a Mac and Windows and mobile view. So that kind of helps testing um, quickly a lot of different browsers. And usually when it's time to test something mobile, I'm just like, guys, hand over your phones. Like It's time to gather all the mobile devices we have in the office and start testing that way. But there are still online tools that can help um, show you what it might look like on a mobile device if you don't have a device in front of you. Does so that you answer? So you don't hook up like a, so you don't install a virtual machine with every operating system on your personal computer and go through each one? Um, you used to. No. I, I, do, I do have a virtual box, so I sometimes run that to see what it would look like in, in Internet Explorer or Firefox on a Windows machine. And we do have a Windows machine in the office, so sometimes I'll use that as the, the tiebreaker because we have browser stack that we use that can imitate Firefox on Windows, and then I have virtual machine on my computer, a virtual box, and I can use that to see what Firefox on Windows may look like. If there are discrepancies, then I'll just go right to the Windows machine we actually have in the office and use that as a tiebreaker. But now Windows XP is dead, so it's easier. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Um, I guess from a more, uh, more from a perspective of like uh, working with the interaction between the developers, um, a lot of back-end developers are kind of creeping more into the front-end, especially lately because of the bias of JavaScript framework. So what, what if you have like a three-quarters developer, someone who's um, comfortable on the back-end, comfortable just strictly writing code and maybe being very, very basic or something like that, as far as HTML, as far as like uh, layout goes, I mean, do you still try to establish? I mean, a I guess like a strict or a relatively strict separation of concerns, or do you almost try to, you know, see almost try to mix um, both responsibilities between the developers, or, or do you or do you kind of retreat back and say, okay, I'll I'll focus more heavily on design and let you. Or do you yeah. kind of try to split it a little bit more equally? No, that's that's an interesting question. Um, so our team is relatively small, and because of that, there is a lot of overlap with what we all do. I mean, I, I do dive into the back-end code when I need to, and we have the other developers, they have no problem editing Haml and JavaScript. And sometimes if I am struggling with something with JavaScript, I'll, I'll go and bug one of the guys, like, hey, can we pair on this together? Um, because a lot, they do have a lot of JavaScript knowledge also, so there's overlap there, you could argue. Um, I just, I think that the more, the more overlap the better, I think, is, is basically, in my experience, what works best. You know, as a front-end developer, the more I can learn about the back-end, um, the better it'll be for projects as a whole, and the back-end developers, the more they can start to learn about front-end and learn about good design choices, and like I said, care about usability, the more they dive kind of um, towards that direction, the better a project will be in the end. So overlap is definitely a good thing. Um, when you say, like, who who does what? If, if there are people yeah, who have I'm overlap, like, who does what? Like the execution, because I'm I'm kind of in the position of being on this three quarter, where it's like, you know, I can like I'm working on a project where I do uh, you know Rails backend stuff, but I also do Angular stuff. You know, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, like. We still obviously need a, a, you know, a fully knowledgeable front end person. But then it becomes, you know, where exactly do we, where exactly do we want to have that meeting point to be? Interesting question. Um, I think it depends on the team. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure yeah, yeah I'm sure. I mean, it, it definitely comes down to that. I mean, I saw there was a great presentation at Ruby Fusa where a designer was talking about some of the things that they did in their group, and one that was really funny was she said they have a file called shame.css. And she said, basically, okay, if you're a developer, you're probably not going to do your CSS right, so just put it in there, and then I'll come back and fix it. <laughs> 
So okay. you know, that works for that group, but it could depend because you could have a group where you actually do have developers that are also good at CSS. So I think it just right. I mean, there's a lot of overlap on our team, but um, for a lot of the sys, like sysadmin work that has to go on with the application, like I clear, I don't dive into anything like that. So that's obviously a part where one of the other guys would handle that, and then they may be very comfortable with Haml and SAS also and JavaScript, but if it came time to create like a page layout and like Photoshop time, like I'm clearly the the person in the, I guess that would handle that on the team. Um, so there are some some cases where there's clear distinction, like you do this, I do this, but um, you know, really when it comes to the, the feature, whatever's gonna help get it done fastest, you know, with the highest quality, we just we do a pretty good job of deciding, like, well, I'll take this part, you take this part. Um, and usually I know, like, I, I'll handle the, the Hamel and the SAS side of things. And most of the JavaScript, if I can, if I need help, you know, hey, guys, want to help look at this, too? Sure. I think uh, a lot of people in this room are starting to, you know, coming from the back end and starting to get into front end. What advice do you have for someone who is a designer, just a designer, and they want to start through coming into the front end and then maybe the back end eventually? Like, what I don't. What is your story? Uh, how, how, you know, how do you how do you help someone who's good at design start to code? I, I've never really even thought about that. Yeah, before. that's a great question. Um, have you ever heard of uh, like HTML mockups yeah. in browser designing or designing in the browser, anything like that? Um, so I do that often, and that's I think that's a great way for a designer to break into some code because honestly I think a monkey could learn how to write HTML. So um, you know if they have a design in Photoshop, you know it can be simple, but you know tell them to try and create that with some basic HTML and CSS before showing the teams. So, like they have their Photoshop mockup, and then tell them to try to think of it like a, like building a prototype, you know, before we actually build the feature, like try and make a very basic prototype in like HTML and CSS before you show everyone and try and encourage them to make code mockups of their designs as opposed to like Photoshop pixel mockups first and kind of break them into the HTML and the CSS like, okay, we have to design like a tiny little part of this page, try just building an HTML and showing us first, you know, before you hit Photoshop. Um, there's, um, if you just want to do, you know, do searches for in browser designing or designing in the browser, keywords like that, you'll find a lot of stuff. It's like a live preview, like as you write the markup. Yeah. Design. And it's it's nice because you know in Photoshop everything's flat. You know, if you want to show a hover state for a button you designed, you have to have a separate layer or a separate folder for that hover state and you know click through. But if you have a very basic HTML mockup of your design, you can quick CSS, you know, hover attribute for you to to show what that will look like. So you can actually go you know, go to the mouse and mouse over the button. You can just code the hover state instead. Um, so it kind of makes the mock-up more interactive and easier to see what the final product will be, easier to like visualize it. That makes sense. Okay, yes. What is the absolute worst design mistake that back-end programmers make that you have to fix? Um, Interesting. She has to out her own team. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. They're all here. <laughs> They're all here. Why? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll You'll pass. Um, uh, CSS in the view instead of in a CSS file. Oh. Um, you know, when something needs to be quick and dirty, that's a quick and dirty way. So I'll, I'll own that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that has to be followed. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL ROG videos playlist.